with all this shit. I'm gonna explain why I do it. All right. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Bernard Mendez. Bernard, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Bernard started his first website as an 11-year-old in the age of dial-up. You're going to have to tell us what dial-up is later on for those who don't know what it is. No, absolutely. He studied at the Illinois Institute of Technology, where he was elected as a student government VP of Finance. On his time off, he was a member of the Motorcycle Racing Club and founder of the school's martial arts gym. After graduation, Bernard joined the Army as a logistics officer, where he deployed across the world and served as a parachute jump master with the first and third special forces group for six years before moving on to the tech world. He went back to his roots and began to relearn the tech world where he found many new challenges. Bernard is a manager partner and CEO at Interco Industries. Interco provides clients with technology solutions through data analytics, AR, VR, and custom hardware solutions to help reduce overhead, lower equipment, and improve decision-making and maximize efficiency. Bernard, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jason. Glad to be here. So, Bernard, what got you interested in tech? Well, two questions. First, what got you interested in tech at such an early age? And for those of us who don't know, don't remember, what is dial up? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, great questions. Um, so, dial up, you know, back in, back in the day, we used to use the phone line to uh, transfer digital information before, you know, fiber and, and the radio frequencies we have now. Um, so, it was very slow. I first got into tech through uh, video games. I was a big fan of the original StarCraft. Um, and yeah, once I started diving into the, you know, the brand new World Wide Web, whether it was downloading music or playing video games, I, you know, I found a whole new virtual world to explore. Um, and what got me into starting that website is that it's actually a pretty funny story. I used to be a big skateboarder. I was that skateboard kid that was spending, you know, whatever I put my mind into, I would spend hours doing it and getting better and trying to be the best I could be. Um, so that first website was actually uh, a skateboarding store website. So I'd gotten all my favorite skateboards, downloaded all the image files, uploaded, coded all the HTML. And I had, you know, back in the day, I thought it was the coolest thing. It was this little like stainless steel background and all these skateboards lined up like a digital skateboard store, if you will, way ahead of its time. And, uh, and I did it for fun. I did it because I wanted to see all the cool skateboards that I liked that I couldn't afford. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it was kind of a little passion project of sorts. So in the past, you've been, you've done tech, involved in student government, motorcycle racing, martial arts, who is a jump master, special forces entrepreneur and you volunteered to law school like you, you're trying to be like elon musk jr or something like what's yeah, going I mean, on and someone to tell you do all of it pretty well right like so yeah so so no i mean if there's never been like you know I'm, I, I'm a big goal setter but that goal's always been very fluid and i'm always kind of iterating taking feedback and, and kind of changing the goal up a little bit um yeah yeah so so the student government uh that was also kind of a whole new world that opened up uh originally i had started I tried founding the mixed martial arts club at Illinois Institute of Technology. And because uh, there wasn't any martial arts there, I was huge in the cage fighting. I was always doing jujitsu tournaments. I was doing MMA tournaments. I was, it was like my new passion. So I had moved on from skateboarding to cage fighting in college. Um, and uh, I had found out about the student activities fund, which was controlled by the student government. And they're the people, they're the students. It's a group of uh, nine students. They work with all the school facilitators, and they're the ones who fund all the all the student clubs. So we had everything from like the electric car racing club, and there was a bunch of like mechanical engineers that were spending like 40 Gs a year building up these really cool electric cars that then they would race against MIT and all the other tech schools. And uh, we had uh, all kinds of like cultural organizations, but no martial arts one. So I wanted to create one, and I had to learn like how the gov the student government works, how their funding works, all the bylaws, and all that. Um, so that's what originally got me at the student government, actually. Yeah, when I was in college, I was president of my student government my senior year. Like when I when I'm talking about hiring people, I say you know those those good biases and bias and bias like good and bad biases. I want my biases, but if I look at resume, if I see student government, I kind of you know like give them an extra you know kick in the you know. Of course, you wouldn't know that unless you knew that, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's hard because you're all students, right? So there's no real, like, hierarchy. Um, the organization's very loose, and, and, and everything is kind of on a volunteer basis. Um, but but I ended up loving the world. And, uh, and after I had learned about it, I opened up, you know, the martial arts club. 
Uh, it even got to the point where I was contracting some of my favorite instructors from the gyms I used to train at. And I was able to get them paid to come in and teach uh, all kinds of classes, whether it was like uh, ended up opening a, uh, our own fight team. So it was, you know, me and my friends going around tournaments to like Las Vegas, Florida, like Wisconsin, all flying out of Chicago. And most of that was was funded by the school through through this fund. So it was really cool. We got to represent our school at, in a sport and in tournaments where like there was no representation before us. So, so what, what age were you when you started doing martial arts? I started a little late, believe it or not. I started around 17. Um, in late 16, I started getting into it. 17, I got really into judo down in South Texas where I grew up. And um, I, yeah, I fell in love with that and, you know, quickly let go of all the other sports. And, and I just went, went all into judo. Uh, from judo, I got into jujitsu. And then from jujitsu into boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and then just ended up cage fighting, you know. So how different all the different styles? I mean, are they all these? Are they have those all the same base foundations to learn them, or how different are they? Yeah, so so they're very different. So so like let's say jujitsu and judo and wrestling, those are more like grappling arts, right? So we're not talking about any kind of strikes. So there's no kicks, punches, or elbows. It's all like choke holds, takedowns, throws. Um, it it, it, it involves a lot of physics, and um, we actually part of the club. Uh, our instructors would teach a women's self-defense course to the sororities on on campus um, and a lot of that was based off of jiu-jitsu and judo techniques because that allows like a 150 pound woman to take down a 200 plus pound man using the proper leverage and physics behind it so very very powerful martial arts whereas uh, kickboxing muay thai boxing you know much more striking oriented so we're talking about punching kicking elbows and muay thai knees um so, so, so really dynamic sports, very different, but when you put them together, you get MMA or mixed martial arts or cage fighting or whatever you want to call it. And that's, that's what drew me to it. It was kind of like the ultimate, you know, sport in my like early twenties, young American male <laughs> mentality. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to go do the, the biggest, coolest stuff. I'm going to go into that. And that's how that got started. Yeah. And the army, they teach us combatives. What is combat? What is combatives based off of? Yeah, so combatives is actually pretty similar to Tama Bay. They mix in all kinds of different techniques. I used to be uh, one of the assistant instructors in Korea in my first duty station. Um, so I, we we trained a lot of people out there. It was, it was, in, the, it was in the hundreds in that year. Um, we would have some really big classes. And, and yeah, combatives is actually, it's a pretty good program. Uh, they use a lot of like knee and elbow techniques from like Muay Thai. They use a lot of jiu-jitsu, choke holds, takedowns from judo. Um, and then once you start getting into the higher levels of combatives, <clears throat> now you're integrating like weapons training whether it's knives pistols rifles uh you're you're doing a lot of the drills with full kit on body armor kevlar uh helmets and everything um so it gets a lot harder mm -hmm. and you got to be more cognizant of like the weight on you of making sure you're not falling in different ways whereas like and i'm sure you got to remember okay, you both have kevlar on how does the kevlar affect the other person too right yeah well, well that's the thing it, it, it could also be a tool or a weapon if you you know you had butt somebody with a kevlar on and they're not getting back up um so so it does it, it, it does bring different kind of tools but combatives is more for like a life or death situation whereas mma is is you know a martial arts more competitive more of a sport i mean i'm not saying it's not as dangerous because it's equally dangerous but it's a much more controlled environment um, and there's many more rules behind like cage fighting. I know it looks wild when you're looking at it, but there, there's actually a lot of rules in place. And there's, it, it's honestly like playing chess, except if you lose, you get your arm broken or you get knocked out. Cause there's moves and there's counter moves and you can chain moves together kind of like in chess. Um, and if you don't know the counter to like one of those, well then now you're, they caught you and then, you know, you're. So I'm, I'm sure that's why UFC fighters actually study each other and watch film and stuff like, you know, what they do in different situations. A lot of them do. Yeah. A lot of them are very, very uh, meticulous and they'll study hours and hours of film or the coaches will. And then uh, they'll kind of base, you know, their uh, strategy off of that. Um, but there's that famous, uh, what is it? Mike Tyson quote, right? That everybody's got a plan until yeah. they get punched in the mouth. And it's, it's a hundred percent true. And that's why a lot of my training was more reaction based. And uh, I mean, I'd, I'd have a plan, but I would drill reactions every morning. I'd spend hours drilling movements, drilling kicks. So I would throw like 100 low kicks with the left, 100 low kicks with the right, uh, 100 middle, uh, then switch back and forth head, um, and, uh, and, and different wrestling techniques, so um, different escapes, different movements, because I wanted to get that muscle memory in. And that's what allowed me to be really fast during tournaments, because as soon as, you know, 
somebody's trying to to uh, take me down or something, I know how to sprawl, go around them, and then go for the neck and try to choke them out. And it was almost automatic. It was automatic, like my body yeah, was running on autopilot. So yeah. Because um, I think there's like a big UFC fight today or tomorrow. I was watching like the, like the run-up to it. And the one guy, I can't remember, there's a fighter from Ecuador. And they were saying like every fight he does, he studies all the fighters from the lowest round all to his round. Like he's like that close to his five fights, he studies all 10 fighters. Like, yeah. man, that's pretty impressive, right? They're not only studying your own fight, you study everyone else, right? Yeah, well, well, and, and it goes back to, like, I mean, if you lose, there's very dire consequences. Um, so, like, me personally, uh, I took it very, very seriously back when I was competing. And I actually don't really follow it that much anymore now. I'm, I'm all into tech and business and stuff. But um, back in college, I was a true fan. I mean, I would never miss a fight. Uh, me and my coaches and the team would always be going to, like, the bars and watching everything. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a chess game. And if you lose, I mean, you're uh, embarrassed in front of everyone, like everybody knew you were fighting or your friends and family, like, and, and it's hard because you can't like blame it on the quarterback or blame it on the wide it's, receiver. It's you, your preparation is it's like you. Exactly. Um, Cause I don't watch a lot of the UFC fights. I remember I watched one a couple of months ago. It was the one when the McGregor came back. Right. Uh -huh. And so I was watching it. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So I was watching it, and like the, what's the underscore, and like there's like a lot of blood and stuff in the far like, and there's like come some of it. Well, I said I, I made a comment. They have a chance to clean the blood up now. They looked at me like they don't clean it up. Like, what do you mean don't clean it up? Well, yeah. that blood stays there until the last fight. <laughs> Are you yeah. kidding me? Like yeah. what? I, mean, I just blew my mind. Right, like this first fight, the six more fights, this blood's gonna be on the floor or sweat. You said you have a time of fight, six people's fights, blood and sweat. I like. It is like this blue right? Right. By the end of the by the by the last fight, the main event, <clears throat> yeah, there is like all kinds of whatever. Um, yes, you know, sometimes they do try to clean it up in yeah. between, but sometimes there's no time. Um, that that just totally blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, especially thinking about how the world's gotten nowadays. But I mean, you know, some germs aren't bad for you. Some germs are actually good for you. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything. Um, but I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, given the current climate and everything, I don't really worry about about it that much i'm more so taking care of my body i'm eating yeah. very clean i'm getting as much cardio and like weightlifting balance as i can i'm going out and hiking getting fresh air getting sunlight and from everything i've read all like the peer-reviewed journals not just articles and everything everything I've, I've researched um that's that's the best way you can protect your health right yeah. now is you know so being healthy. someone is starting out and they want to get to learn how to do, they do like jujitsu first or should they start doing first or does it really matter what they learn first? Yeah. Yeah. So somebody starting out, um, <clears throat> I, I would say, you know, look at what's out there, uh, see gyms in your area and then try them, try them out, like go sample them, do your own experiment, see things firsthand. And then wherever you're getting the best vibes from, like whatever you think it, it where the people, the coaches seem the best and the, but the best fit, I would go with that. Um, because one, well, once you get into it, you'll yeah, it's it's fun. It's very very fun. No, is it ex like is it like most hobbies kind of expensive, time of, time consuming? So back when I was training, um, I mean, I took it very seriously and I was competing. So for me, it was very time consuming. I was doing I got I got two bachelors out of uh, Illinois Tech, so I was studying over twenty plus credit hours, doing all these extracurriculars, Army ROTC, and I was still putting in like hours a day training because if I lost, I lost big. Um, so for me, it was, I mean, as a college kid in Chicago, I was paying like 120 a month for the gym, which at the time was astronomical for me as a college kid. I was like, I can't afford this, but I really need these coaches. And that's part of what got me to, to build the club. And then I was able to bring those coaches to the school uh, for free. So the school paid for the coaches. And so all I had to do is share with my fellow students. So I was very happy to do that. Um, and then I went from, you know, paying 125 a month to not paying anything. And instead of me having to take the bus or ride my bicycle like half an hour or an hour to the gym, now the instructors would come to me to the school club. Um, and I'd have my friends and, you know, like the sororities that we did the women's uh, self-defense with and all these other students that got to like learn and share and, and grow. So, um, uh, you know, there's, I guess it could be expensive or you could figure out ways to kind of solve you know, the economic issues, at least, um, there's all kinds of, of, of good systems out there. Um, but nowadays I haven't looked at Seattle prices. I'm guessing they're probably around the same, yeah. probably like a hundred a month, maybe a little bit more with inflation and everything that's going on now. So some people will say like, like martial arts is dangerous. Some might say it's safe. That's sort of something else. Some people might say it's safe or dangerous motorcycle racing. Yeah. How do you get involved with that? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like, we, like you, you used to do a, a, a martial arts fight, then an hour later, you're motor soccer racing, going from one dangerous thing to yeah. another dangerous thing. So, so I mean, it, it might sound that way. Um, motorcycles were something that I always, like, I was always interested growing up. Uh, I grew up pretty poor, so, you know, I never had a chance of, like, buying anything, or, or I didn't have family that had a motorcycle or anything like that. Um but it was always something I, I wanted to get into. And uh, so I, I was doing Army ROTC. I was, I was working at the library in the school, and I was doing all these extracurriculars and everything. And, and I saved up money. And then finally, my junior year, I was able to buy the motorcycle that I, that I rode over here with today, actually. So it's a, it's a little on the older side, but I've been keeping her up to date. I've been upgrading all the internals and, and doing all the maintenance. Um, but yeah, it was something I always wanted, and, and that was my first vehicle. Uh, ever and and that's part of why I I, I still uh, I still have it today. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard for me to get rid of it. And instead, I'm just fixing it up. Even though I I put more money into it to fix it than it's worth. But uh, in my opinion, yeah, it's uh, someday it'll be like a museum piece in my living room when I have a big enough living room or something like that. <laughs> so, what's your dream motorcycle? Um, y you know, lately I don't I don't think much about about like anything really except for for building this business and, and and learning tech um and improving but um yeah i don't know i would have to kind of like my suggestion with the gyms i would have to do like a nice big round robin test week where i go test drive a bunch of bikes but i will say that the next one i would get um will probably something uh, it'll probably be something more comfortable it might be like a harley or something something not one of the big ones but mm -hmm. not a small one either like a 1200 harley that'll uh that'll get that'll still be fast enough for me but much more comfortable because i've got an r6 right now so it's a super sports mm -hmm. bike so it's the one i used to race in college and it's it's made for the racetrack not really for these streets um so it gets a little hard on the back but it's very fun because it's i mean you know, you can pop a wheelie pretty easily if you're into that. I don't do that because I think it's kind of a little too dangerous. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it, it's got a lot of speed. Yeah. Yeah. When I when I stayed in Italy for two years, everyone there who like like my motorcycle, they all bought back a Ducati from Italy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. When you're stationed out there. Yeah. 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 Ducatis are cool, man. Um, I drove or I rode one of my buddies' Ducati. You know, I I wasn't sure if I really liked it. Obviously, they sound amazing. They look super sexy um they're they're one of the coolest bikes out there uh but i really you know that v-twin and and their clutch i was used to that like really precise japanese clutch and and that really precise japanese uh engine uh with like really smooth uh uh tack bands and then the ducati is a little more it's more like a harley it's more a little burpy it's, it's yeah it's, it's definitely more sexy looking you yeah. know and then the ducati the name you know is like yeah yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't think about bikes too much anymore, man. I'm, I'm happy with the one I got out there, uh, the one I rode in today, and um, I need to do a little more fixing on her. But, uh, but yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing happy. no motor soccer racing for you recently? Not at all. That all ended in college. I mean, I'll, I'll ride pretty fast around here, and you know, in the highways, if it's, if it's safe and if it's open and if it's a road, I know, you know, I'll have a little fun. But as far as racing, uh, no, not at this time. Maybe, maybe I might pick it up in a year or so. What, what's the farthest you've driven? Like going from like from like one town to another town, like three hundred miles, four hundred miles, or uh, the farthest on that bike. I used to do a lot of Rainier trips back when I was stationed uh, here with First Group at, at Fort Lewis, uh, pretty close to film. I used to go to, to uh, the Rainier, the park entrance, because there's a lot of fun twisties on the way out there, and then you know where. Um, What's that city with the railroad and the lake next? It's really pretty out there. Yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about. I can't think yeah. of anything either. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about, though. Uh, so that's that ends up being maybe a two, two and a half hour ride, okay. depending on like you know going back and forth. And and I, I would go with my buddy. We had the Bluetooth headsets. We'd have like music, and then we could chime in and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I could take phone calls on it too, and and the person won't know I'm on a bike, even though it's <laughs> super loud. It's got like really cool boom mic in there, and so it went from like just riding alone to riding with like a friend or two of mine. And when we all had the headset, uh, we'd be nerding out like if it was Star Wars or something. Red Leader, this is Blue Leader coming in from the left. <laughs> and then we're driving down the highway, just blasting by cars. Yeah. It's, it's fun, yeah. So let's talk about your Army career for a little bit. For those who don't know, talk about what a jump master is and what Special Forces is. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so I went in. I went in as a logistics officer, stayed as a logistics officer uh, my whole time. But I was lucky enough to uh, to get picked for first Special Forces group uh, coming out of Korea. Um, 
So I never got the green beret or anything. I was a maroon beret, red beret. So uh, if you go on, can you talk about the process of being, even being selected for special forces? That's yeah. a hard process. Well, 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 that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Though. Like I wasn't, I, I never got the green beret. I wasn't a green beret. I was uh, a logistics officer in special forces group. Okay. Um, and uh, so I didn't do the same selection process they do. And then the jump master process, it's, uh, it's like a branch immaterial process. Um, so a leadership will select you based off like, you know, high competency, like very high ratings. Um, and then when you go over there, it's uh, <clears throat> one of the hardest schools in the army. And it, it's very hard for, for a good reason. Cause you've got people's lives in your hands. Cause I mean, as literally a jump, in your hands. Yeah. It literally in your hands. Yeah. Cause as a jump master, we're the ones that are uh, inspecting all every single part of their equipment. So let's say you got a paratrooper, uh, full parachute. So you got a main in the back, you got the reserve in front, you got the rifle on the left, then you got the rucksack with like all the ammo and all the gear in between your legs. That's like tied up to your waistband. Um, and so we've got to memorize every single piece of equipment right down to like the stitching on like the reserve parachute, the reinforced little red stitching in the middle of like the handle and everything. Um, and what we do is there's a, it's called the sequence. So we go over, you start at the helmet, you check the helmet, you look up, you check for like the pads, you come down and do the chin strap, make sure everything's connected and you got to see and touch every single piece. And then you just keep going down your sequence, you're doing your waistband, you're making sure everything's tied in correctly, you're making sure like all the adjustments are made, you're making sure there's like the perfect amount of space. Um, and, and, and the reasoning behind that is, let's say, uh, you know, your waistband wasn't strapped properly. Well, now when you jump out and you've got, I don't know, you know, 45 pounds in your rug, your rifle on the side and all the weight shifts out, you know, you could end up landing, your rock might not come out right, you're right, you might land on your rifle, like there's all kinds of bad things that happen, those are minor issues, right, worst case scenario is you fall out of your harness, um, or, uh, or you get, uh, your parachute gets caught on the airplane, and it doesn't eject, and then you're on the side of the airplane hitting the plane at like 130 miles an hour or about that's three that's to be painful yeah yeah three to four thousand feet in the air uh luckily it never happened to me and it never happened to any of my guys or anyone i saw but it's actually more common than, than people think yeah so what would you do like you someone you see someone that they're just really nervous right you just calm them down or just are people really nervous yeah yeah so um i mean it depends there's like on for first timers right yeah there, there there's a few first i mean there's never first timers um so so they all have got uh everyone does five jumps at airborne school That's right. b okay. before you, you you even get to an airborne unit or or before you jump jump with an airborne unit um and so that's a three-week course of fort benning um, so that's like the first step If we were to talk about like the process for jump master. Um, the first step would be, you know, you're in an airborne unit, you've gotten all the high rank, uh, high ratings and everything. Your leadership sends you out to, uh, well, to airborne school first. You do your three weeks of bending where they teach you. It's basically learning how to fall for lack of a better term. Cause, uh, that's where you're most. Yeah. Always, so there's not the jumping out. It's the, it's the landing. It's the landing. You. Except, you're exactly right. And, and the reason behind it is we're not jumping with like, the really smooth civilian uh, shoots, the canopy shoots, and you can steer and like move around everywhere. Um, we're, we're using static line shoots that their whole purpose is we want a C-130 or C-17 to fly right over the drop zone, shoot out as many people and equipment, vehicles, gear, everything we can get out as short a time as possible. And then we've got about a minute while you're falling to get down as fast as possible because we don't want to be flying around in those shoots getting shot at. So um, they move pretty fast. You, you, it's, it's over before you know it really. And, uh, you really got to know how to land because otherwise you're, you're going to get hurt. I mean, I had an experience where we had a night jump over here at, at Rogers DZ by, uh, um, by Tacoma or between Tacoma and Rainier. You can actually see Rainier when you're jumping out of the airplane and we had a night jump. So you can see Rainier at night, but there was a layer of fog about seven to nine feet above the ground. And it kind of looked like a cloud. Um, and I remember seeing that fog because the moon was big enough to where you could see the fog. And I remember thinking, huh, weird. I've been falling for like 30 seconds. The ground should be coming up soon, but that looks like a cloud. But you know what? I'm going to get prepared and get in position to fog because I think the floor might be there. And sure enough, the floor was right there. Uh, right after I land, I hear somebody yelling out in pain and this and that. And sure enough, uh, somebody, you know, assumed it wasn't the floor and they were still higher up than they were and they just hit it down busted their knee uh so yeah we caught like the medic my me and my buddy had to carry all his gear and like help him out to like the ambulance tent and then rock everything back to, to the assembly area but um 
yeah, it's it, it's 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 pretty dangerous in that sense. Um, I've personally known several people that that have either broken like their ankle or their knee or both. And it could be a little dangerous. Is it true the small you are, the better it is for you? Like I've heard, like if you're a big dude, it's you know you fall faster and you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it actually absolutely is. And when you think about like the basic physics behind it, um, everybody's got the same size parachute, whether you're like a 125 pound female or a 250 pound green beret, right? Um, we're all using the same parachutes. Uh, the gear is are pretty much like the same weight. Um, so, so it's a physics problem, right? You got the surface area and the same size as parachute on both, but one's got, you know, let's say 300 plus pounds with all the gear. And the other one's got maybe 175 or 200 with, with gear. Um, the 300 is going to fall a lot faster and a lot harder than that 200. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right there. Has, how, how did you handle that? Suppose you're, 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 you know, getting ready to jump and someone says, I can't do this. I have a bad feeling. I'm not going to jump. What happens then? Oh yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, so it, it, it never happened to me or any of my guys or my team personally. Um, but we, as jump masters, we do all the briefings. So we, we, we control the entire airborne operation. Um, we coordinate with the aircraft. We, uh, go and survey the drop zone, make sure there aren't any like, you know, danger of like wires or trees or boulders or whatever. We try to go out there and, and kind of set everything up. We do uh, all like the radio comms from the drop zone when the birds are coming up. We inspect the aircrafts. We inspect like all the exits. We do our, our door checks. So, so like the most fun part is doing a door check while we're flying out. So we're flying over the drop zone and we're the ones who open up that aircraft door and like on a, you know, a C-130 or a C-130 ramp, we open the ramp up and we literally stick our faces out and do our quick check. And we're making sure that there's no like other aircraft, that there's no like vehicles on the drop zone, or there's no you know enemy on the drop zone, obviously. Um, and so that that was my favorite part, especially like some of the training operations we'd have, like at Rogers, where I, I pop my head out, I'm going 130 miles per hour outside of a C-130, um, and I'm looking around doing my check, and then I pause, and Matt Rainier is right in front of me, just looking glorious as ever, and I was like, God, I love this job, and that's. That's what kept me in. Originally, I was going to get out at like four years. I was going to do four and done, but I ended up doing seven, yeah. So have you done any skydiving since you got out, or that would be too boring for you? No, no. I actually I, I want to get into it. Um, I've done maybe three jumps uh, civilian side, uh, but I haven't done the course. I haven't done any of that. So I would have to retake like the course and all that. It, it's, on my, it's on my training glide path. I've kind of got like every year I do, I do a new type of training to keep the mind sharp and like learn. I'm a big fan of neuroplasticity. I've read a lot of books that have convinced me that the neuroplasticity is very real and that, uh, that you can learn pretty much anything you put your mind to it. If you figure out ways to do it right and really just work at it. Um, so this year I'm doing sailing at, uh, at my second sailing course yesterday in South Lake union. Amazing, very nice and windy. And, and the other person didn't show up. So I had a one-on-one -on -one with the instructor um but uh uh next year i'll do pilot training and i think the year after that i'll do skydiving yeah so next talk about you do some volunteer work at a law school yeah yeah so um yeah john marshall uh i you know growing up i i always wanted to be either a pilot or a lawyer and i ended up being neither <laughs> um but uh you know just being the kind of guy i am i had to kind of go and explore and, and experiment and see see if i if it was something i really wanted to do uh, so yeah, I volunteered for a, a summer program at uh, John Marshall Law downtown Chicago. Um, it was my junior or senior year, uh, but yeah, I loved it. It was super cool. Um, my favorite classes were the uh, mock trials. It all it was almost reminded me of like all the fight dynamics that I was doing in in mixed martial arts, where it's like it's me versus you know whether I was the plaintiff or the defendant, yeah. plaintiff versus defendant, defendant versus plaintiff, and they would give us all kinds of uh, uh, little scenarios. So I remember one of them was about um, a person that was on an airplane that the stewardess was telling them to like put their seatbelt on. And then when there was like turbulence, they, they didn't do it and they end up hitting their head and then they're suing the airline or something like that. And then you have to either be like plaintiff or defendant for just, so it's like, you know, different scenarios that they'll give us. Um, so that kind of stuff I loved because then you build a case and you don't get to choose like, oh, I want to defend this guy or I want to you know, defend the airline. Um, they kind of just throw it out there. All right, Bernard, you're a plaintiff and uh, Susan, you're a defendant. And then they give us maybe like a very short time to prep and then you're out there and you're doing it. Um, and so that was pretty cool. Uh, as part of that program, I built a, uh, an LSTAT uh, uh, training course for uh, Illinois Tech. Um, so I contracted a, uh, 
uh, an LSAT instructor to come into school and, and teach like everyone that was interested in, in pre-law or in going to law school after their bachelor's. So we all got to do um, like in-person classrooms. Um, she would even do virtual. And this was way back in like 2011. Uh, that was one of the first virtual classes I ever took was with, with, with that instructor. Um, so yeah, so, so, so I went for the law school thing and, and I, you know, I quickly realized that the, I didn't want to be a lawyer. Like the job wasn't, I love the trial portion of it but the trial is like such a small fraction of what you actually do. Um, so I had a choice, you know, originally I was going to go army reserves and, and be a JAG. So go to law school, do the attorney as an army or, or uh, an attorney in the army. <clears throat> um, but I decided it wasn't for me. And I decided to just go active duty and, and explore that route for a few years for what I thought was going to be four years that turned into seven. Yeah. So after you got out of the army, you got, you know, you know, you got really involved in tech and you, as you see, you really, really learned tech. How hard or easy was it to relearn tech? Was all the concepts the same? I'm sure languages were different. How did that work out for you? Uh, yeah, no, great question. Um, it was actually really hard. <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, I mean, so even though I'd gone, I went to like a, you, you know, I started my first website yeah, when I was 11 in middle school. Um, and I was like downloading songs on Napster and figuring out all that tech stuff. Way, Napster. Yeah, we have way back we're, in we're the day. We're all starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Metallica suit them and all that BS. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in the tech really early. I went to tech high school. I went to tech college, obviously. Um, but then those six, seven years in the army, you know, I didn't really touch it one bit. So, you know, people ask about like, oh, well, you studied, you know, computer science and blah, blah. And I actually didn't. I've got two bachelors that are not tech bachelors, but going to a tech school, um, they forced us to do programming classes like real chem labs, bio labs. And so because, you know, we were graduating with a bachelor's of science from Illinois Institute of Technology, they expected us to have to know tech. Um, but that was in 2013, 2012, or that, you know, um, this was fast forward to 2019 and I don't, everything's changed. Tech is like, you know, we've, we're going through so many revolutions and Moore's law and everything else tech wise that, um, it doesn't really matter what you know unless you're learning what the latest greatest is. So that was an advantage I had coming in because once I realized that tech has changed so drastically, you know, at first it was very uh, demoralizing thinking like, oh man, I don't remember how to program. I don't remember any of this. Like I've, you know, I've never been that good at math, like uh, all these issues and, and, and obstacles. But when I realized that, that because of how fast tech has evolved, we're kind of all on the same playing field now. Um, and if you really put your mind to it and you start taking resources and, and, and just uh, uh, finding self-help wherever you can, uh, um, yeah, you, you can make it happen. But it was, it, it was hard. It took a lot of long nights, um, a lot of long days. And uh, uh, when I got back in it, it, into tech, it's the same time I was leaving the Army. So I was having to, like, wrap up my Army career. They wanted, you know, I was doing really good for them. So I got handpicked to be uh, uh, the third Special Forces group j4 um so so my boss was the xo and his boss was the third special forces group commander so like the green beret in charge of all the green berets on in brag that don't belong to one sfc um so so it was hard to, to you know keep that work up learn all the resume stuff and all like how to get a job leaving the army and all of that things and at the same time i was trying to teach myself like the latest in tech like doing programming classes online and uh and and just really really trying to fight for 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 what I want, which, which is Interco Industries, um, and and to build like all this new tech products with the latest and greatest everything to provide real value. So from your experience, someone has never done tech before; they want to learn coding. What language do they learn first? So does that even matter? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, it, it, a great question. That does matter. Um, and and. I think the resources kind of remain the same. So I personally, I'm a big fan of like the online, like at your own pace courses. Um, so I took like Coursera, edX. Uh, I'm a big fan of data camp. If you want to learn that program, I, I would go with data camp. It's like $30 a month and, uh, and you can learn as much or as little as you want. Um, uh, they'll provide certs and everything too. If you know, you really need a piece of paper to show an employer or whatever. Uh, I'm not a big fan of like diplomas or certs or, or what have you, but I'm a big fan of the knowledge you know, behind them and actually learning. Um, language wise, I would say that you, you got to do your research and figure out what it is you want to do. Like, for example, you want to build websites, well, then um, you might want to go into like Node.js, JavaScript, I, I would kind of shy away from HTML unless you really want I mean, HTML is an important base, obviously, but uh, 
the HTML, JavaScript, or whatnot. Um, I was much more interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I looked at you know the top languages there in Python, just just uh, <coughs> you know above and beyond most of the other languages because of the way it's structured, because of the framework behind it allows for you know neural pathway programming and everything. Um, and it's it's actually easier to learn than 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 you'd think. Um, it's a very fluid language. So, so me personally, I went out there and I kind of, you know, watched a bunch of YouTube videos, read a bunch of articles, figured out what languages I would need to learn, which Python was the big one. Um, and then I just went all in on that one. Yeah. But I, I would say somebody starting out, kind of see what your end goal is. What kind of products are you trying to build? Is it a web page? Is it a mobile app? Is it, you know, an algorithm? Like, what are you looking to do? And then research the languages that are best suited for that task and then start learning through online sources. And what's your advice on this? Like, you know, these languages is like you learn something, you know, Monday, Tuesday is different, right? It's changed. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you recommend people keep up to date with stuff? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you gotta, you gotta keep learning. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I mess this up sometimes too. Like I'll, I'll get the little reminders from data camp or whatnot. And I'm super busy working on other stuff. I'm like, oh, you know what? I need to set some time on my calendar to like do at least a 30 minute, like little course to kind of refresh on that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I would say, I would say you, you got to keep learning. You got to keep refreshing it. And stuff's changing so often. For example, uh, uh, Word is our, our object detection platform. And that one is using, uh, well, we've got two generations of it now. Um, and we use completely different hardware. And we're experimenting with, like, the performance behind each one. Um, similar, you know, programming scripts, different hardware. And uh, the differences in, in the hardware, maybe three months programming maybe like four or five months and we're already seeing like a you know a double in frame rates per second on the, our new generation so that's how fast tech is changing i mean we went from like under 10 frame rates per second which means that the, the video that we're analyzing looks a little choppy it doesn't look super smooth and now we're in the mid 20s so now it looks smooth um so i was to take a video of you here in this room and i've taught our algorithm or our AI to learn, you know, what your face looks like or whatever, it'll, it'll read you as soon as you catch that frame. And let's say you move around or run back and forth, it'll read you. Whereas before it might've had a little lag. And that's the difference of, you know, the end of last year to this summer. So tech's moving very, very fast. Um, you know, you, you learn the language and you learn the framework, you've got to get foundation, but you got to keep up with it. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it, you're not going to be using the latest. So, I think there's a big disconnect, right, between like non-tech people and the tech people, right? Like a non-tech person like myself, I need a few builders for me. And in my mind, that seems pretty easy. I need it, you can do it in a month. But in reality, it's going to take like six months to a year. Like how do we like solve that disconnect there, right? Just better communication? Yeah, yeah. No, and you're, and you're right about that disconnect. Um, it's, I mean, even for me, like have I built a few websites and all that stuff? Sure. Did I build my own website? No, I hired out, you know, I, 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 we, reach out to web developers or had friends help me out or, or what have you um it's just not a it's 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 more of a specialization thing where i'm i'm focusing on the algorithms focusing on the python and then building uh, uh our framework from there and then hiring out like the web development or the uh like content stuff or uh, even like the web app stuff um i'm looking at uh at, at a few partnerships for that um our back end as well. And this way I'm kind of focusing on like the bread and butter and what sets us apart. Um, and then kind of hiring out the other portions of it. Um, cause if you're trying to do it all yourself, whether you're a tech or non tech, it's not going to happen. And that I learned that a little later it's than too I too much, right? It's way too much. Yeah. You're it's, it's way, way too much. And, and you know, I've, I tried it and it's, it's, you need a team, you know, I'm a big fan of like, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's books and all that. And he's always talking about the, you know, like you need a team, like you could have the smartest person in the world. He, he has a quote, something like this, right? The smartest guy in the room or in like this business field or whatever, versus like a team of four that are kind of smart. And the team of four is going to beat that one guy every time because there's four of them. Um, so that's kind of where, where, where I'm at with Interco right now is we're exploring different partnership uh, opportunities and, uh, and we're looking to bring people in with, with specific skill sets to fill in some gaps and, and kind of really improve our products. So we've got a framework, we've got, you know, a few generations of prototypes for each product line. And, and now uh, we're looking to expand and really start uh, ramping up development. So I've talked about this. There's a term for this. I can't think of it right. An example I use like 
like a so like if I was going to tell someone, you know, open go go open the door, right? A regular person, I would say, go open the door, and you know, they go open it. A developer, you got to say, stand in front of the door, take a six inch step forward, you know, take a right angle of this. It's so detailed, most people don't know that. I forgot what was that called, but it's like stories or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, wireframing, yeah, and wire story, yeah. storyboarding, yeah, storyboarding, storyboarding yeah. and wireframing. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right, and that's um, it's because uh, it's it's the way it's the way machines and computers work, right? Um, people think that like computers are really smart. They're really not. Um, they're just very fast. So uh, uh, now they're getting smart with artificial intelligence, neural networks, and everything that's just come out in the last few years. Um, they're getting. They're starting to get smart, but they're not smart like that MacBook you've got in front of you. It just works really fast. The hardware in there, the ele- the electrons that are floating around in there, um, the way they're wired, it, it it just works extremely fast. But yeah, it's uh, all the programming languages, the manual languages. You got to be very specific. And you got to have parameters and frameworks. And that's a lot of like where the math comes in. Um, but you can do the way tech is built out now, you can do a lot of it with, with basic math or learning as you go. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. You would have to be like a, uh, take a 30 degree turn to your left. If you're in this like position, move forward four four meters, you know, 30 degree to your right, five meters forward, right hand out, you know, open the, like turn the handle clockwise and then and, pull. And a, and a quote unquote, a regular person like, are you kidding me? Right. It's common sense. This, <laughs> this figure this shit out. Yeah. But it's not, doesn't work like that. It doesn't work that. And I, I like your analogy. Yeah. Cause it would be, you know, turn clockwise and then pull with a force of seven and a half pounds or something like, or yeah, between five turn, to 15 pounds. When you say turn clockwise and pull, it's not enough. You guys say turn clockwise and pull with this amount of force yeah 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 you got it yeah you got to be detailed um and that's a, that's a great analogy you brought up uh and it's a funny way to look at it but it's, it is kind of true yeah and 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 you know don't get me wrong with with ai networks and stuff and and convoluted neural networks and stuff that we're building out now in in, in tech all the big tech companies are, are building out startups like mine are like further developing a lot of frameworks um they're starting to get smart, but they're not smart. Like that MacBook is is not smart. Like you're you're millions of times smarter than that MacBook. Um, like for it to see, you know, the information I'm taking right now, looking at you, see the sun rays. I feel like the temperature on on like my fingertips. You know, I'm feeling this wire on my arm from the headphones. Like for a computer to be able to do that and take as much data as we're like taking in biologically, it'd be very, very, very difficult. So. When learning a coding language, can you like go off next like, and just start learning AI, some of the really advanced algorithms, or do you need to learn the basics first? So I would, I, I tackled both in parallel, and then realized I had to go back to basics and kind of move uh, move from the basics on. Um, I would say you should do it kind of in parallel, but but for sure get the basics, but but don't let go of that goal. So like if you want to get into AI, you want to get into machine learning, you want to get into XR and AR and VR and all that stuff, um, keep that in mind, figure out what languages you should go into, and then start training up specifically for those applications. Because so for example, um, you know, learning Python, um, it's 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 a data processing language, the mo you know, that's it's bread and butter, and that's why people love it for AI and machine learning. Um, because the way the logic behind it works. You know, compared to JavaScript, that's made for putting pretty things on a website and arranging everything in colors and all that. It's more about processing numbers and quant, you know, quantification and, and computing, you know, different algorithms. Um, so I only had to learn because I was hiring out everything else or getting like partnerships for everything else. I only had to learn specifically for artificial intelligence or machine learning. So that's why I'm saying like, like figure out what it is you want to do. And then plug into like what language or, or, or processor training or class brings the most value there. And then let experts do the other portion of it, whether it's through friendships, partnerships, uh, paid work, or what have you. So two part question. Part one, from your point of view, what characteristics make up a, a, like a great code or a great developer? And how should a non, someone who has no experience with tech hire a developer? <clears throat> okay, yeah. Um, good characteristics. Um, obviously you want somebody that's experienced, but you also want somebody that's open to new ideas and and that's open to learning. Like if, uh, if I talk to a developer and they're saying that they only want to use this certain language or they only want to use this backend framework or what have you, and I want to use something else, or I want to try both and experiment for a little bit before I choose one. Um, and, and they're adamant about not doing it. Then to me, that's kind of a no go. I'll, I'll just keep looking. 
one wow. thing that gets me too, like you try to hire a developer and they look at you already have, oh, that's, that's crap. I'm, I want to build all over again, right? Well, there's, there's no way all of it is a crap, right? No, like, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it depends, right? If it's a website, sometimes it is easier to just rebuild from scratch. But a lot of times, depending on how they're being built, are they being built per hour? Are they being built per job? It might be like a business thing there where they're trying to take, you know, more development hours to be able to build a client. That's always more. my take. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, that that could be an issue um, to watch out for. But, uh, you yeah, know, I think... Um, I think as long as you've got a good path and the more specific you are, the better. So going back to like our wireframing and our, our storyboarding, right? Um, before I like hire a dev, uh, obviously have a few like conversations through the phone or what have you. Um, but then I've got, I've got a, a pretty strict storyboard and wireframe of what I want. And then I've got kind of the tech stack, if you will. What kind of technology platforms are we using? You know what I mean? Do I need GitHub integration? Do I need a, a dashboard for analytics? Do I need a, a web app with secure login? Or, you know, uh, what kind of functions we want? And then the wireframing and storyboarding, a lot of it is it's big in mobile app design and, and web app, and obviously websites too. But um, there's different platforms that you could get for free, like Adobe XD that, that uh, you know, you could either you could be the designer or you could hire on a designer or partner with a designer and, and you build that framework out and then it's got little like arrows as a wire wireframing portion. So for example, you've got a mobile app, right? Jason Cavness HR and it's got a menu button. So on the wireframe, it'll show that home page and then it'll show the menu button and that menu goes to like your about page, your customers, your clients or whatever. Um, and then it'll show those three lines and those each one of those lines goes to whatever that page is going to open up to. So like about page, boom, it's a little line. It goes to like a box by your about page, it's got your photo and everything. And then from there, if you click back home, then the line goes back to the next page it goes to. So the more detailed you are, yeah, the, the, the more money you could save, the, the more true to your vision you could stick. And obviously, all of this is fluid, and it'll change back and forth depending on, you know, what works, what doesn't work. But um, the more specific you are with what you want when you're hiring developers, not only the cheaper it will be, the more legwork you can do ahead of time to where you get them to like, hey, I just need you to make this live and do all the yeah. back end, build the back end up. And I've already got this front end and design, and then I'm going to plug it in with. That's the you always, you know, you know, the more design you have, the more wireframes you have, more details, the better it is. Mm -hmm. It's like your door example. Um, it, it's like if you were to tell, it's exactly how you said if you were to tell a developer to go, you know, open this door. Compare. You know, like, how you're going to open the door? Yeah, up. which door? I saw three doors out here. Which door was it again? You know, oh, it's the blue one. And in instead of opening the door, he just breaks the glass. Yeah. You didn't say how to open it, so I'll right. open it for you. So it's, it's more so, yeah, you got to prepare yourself. You got to have a vision and then uh, try to get as detailed as you can with that vision. Obviously, don't like, you don't need every single detail or be extremely controlled about it. Like be open to new ideas and they might bring in some good ideas and feedback that you can uh, incorporate. But, um, but yeah, have a vision and then work as much as you can on that vision, whether it's uh, the wireframing or the storyboarding or the design. If you're really into design, you like doing that, like build out an awesome design and then find a front end dev that could put that into your website but if you're trying to learn all of it it's it's very hard it's very very hard yeah so uh, what's your recommendation for new developers finding a job i think a lot of new developers they finish the code academy or work school or whatever and i think it's hard for them to find a job because they don't have the experience they don't have a portfolio now i don't know i think like if you're like a senior level you, you can go from job to job right if you're a junior mm -hmm. level it's, it's very hard to find a job right now how do you recommend that yeah yeah I mean, no just, uh, just, good question and and you're right there's a big disconnect between like a senior developer and uh yeah and and in a an early stage uh, uh dev that's been through like a coding boot camp or something um and it, it's funny because i was i was having a little i was a little dinner event with a very senior developer at one of the big tech companies uh last night and, and he was talking about how you know he's he's done so much in his career he was one he's yeah one of the leading data scientists and um you know, he's done so much and he's, he's at a stage now where like, it's not, it's like he's out of the rat race, right? Like he doesn't have to, he works only on the projects he's passionate about. He's got a great team under him, treats him very well. Like uh, they do really good work and, and they bring a lot of value to, to that company uh, because they're passionate about it and because they can pick and choose. But if somebody's starting out, I think um, they have to kind of throw themselves out there and try to get in as many projects as they can and try to build that resume, right? Like, for example, we're opening up internships to uh, a few Seattle area colleges. I'm also going to my alma mater. I'm aligned with a professor at Illinois Tech, so we're opening up internship positions there. Now that the world's finally uh, uh, gotten into remote work and, and kind of approved of that, if you will, um, 
now's the best time, honestly, to go into tech. Yeah. Cause you could be working anywhere. Now, you know, back in the day you're in Kansas city and you wanted to get a cool job as a developer in Seattle. Like how many issues you have there now you could work for a Seattle company remotely from Kansas city, build up the resume, build up the work experience, and then get hired onto a different company or the same company or whatever a year or two years down and then make the move or what have you. But uh, yeah, I would say uh, throw yourself out there, start working on projects. And a big one for me would be have a, ha have like a, 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 a GitHub, like, like show your work. Um, Cause that's something that I would look at when I'm looking for developers, like, okay, how many commits do you have on GitHub? Like, what have you actually worked on? Let me see some of the code you've built. Let me see what kind of projects you've built. And then really like, like see how they think, see how they work and then see if they're, um, see how they've kept up with those projects. You know, so a lot of times you'll create a cool project, but every project is, has bugs and you're not fixing the bugs or like on GitHub, you've got people asking for these fixes or these issues with your program. And if, you know, you're not fixing them, you're not like keeping up with them. If this was your passion project, sure, like three years ago, um, but I saw you didn't really keep up with it. Well, how do I know that you're going to keep up on, you know, one of our product lines? Um, that you're going to iterate on that feedback properly. And, and so I think it can be applied. Like you look at somebody's GitHub, and like you might not know anything about code, but you see someone had like, you know, a certain number of commits over and over again, it would imply they're at least trying to improve their craft, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's, it's, it, it shows that they're, that they're not just throwing something out there and then, you know, seeing if it's fixed or not. It shows that they're like improving and they're always iterating. And that's, that's something that like I look at, I, I look for personally. Because, um, you know, we're, uh, uh, one of our core values is innovation and and with that comes uh using the latest and greatest technology and iterating taking in feedback uh, bringing in new products developing new lines of experimentation um and for me it's it's really really important like i don't want to be married to a single tech stack i don't want to be married to like one type of back end or one type of framework like i want to experiment with a bunch of different ones collect the data and then figure out which one works the best start iterating on that one, get, you know, product in people's hands, take in feedback through there, um, and then see how we can keep improving it. And if that means we have to switch our tech stack to something else, well then, I mean, maybe we do that. Um, it's not like the other one's going anywhere. We still have all that data and information we've learned. So if two years from now, it turns out that, you know, uh, the tensor, uh, the TPU framework Google's using for machine learning and like the NVIDIA CUDA cores that like graphical processing units are using for machine learning are obsolete and there's something new uh, down the block. Like I'll, I want us to be able to, to move to that new technology or that new hardware or, you know, the new tech stack. Um, so that's something that, that, that I'm, I'm very cognizant with Interco. Like I want us, I wanted to make sure we're using like the latest and greatest because I want our clients to have the best. Like I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't want a client to be able to find something better from a competitor. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming at it from now. So for Inaco, talk about how your founding team came together. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the founding team, uh, there, we've all been friends for a while, except, except for the professor. The professor is probably the more recent addition. Um, but, for example, uh, uh, me and Nick were in the same fraternity together, and he's kind of been our, our, our greatest, like, advisor. Kind of, um, He's been there, done that, sold a few comp tech companies. He's uh, very, very successful, um, and, and he's, he's really a, a good advisor that I can go to when I, when I need some of that, like, higher-level assistance or higher-level help with, with, like, some, you know, company problems and whatnot. Um, uh Corey Corey was actually in first special forces group with me he was a green beret and he was I, I met him uh I was the battle captain in in uh, an operation in Korea um and this was back when Kim Jong-un was like really rattling sabers and you know he was launching missiles over Japan and he was really trying to start stuff with uh with you know the whole world and Trump included um and uh and yeah and, and we we were one of the groups that got mobilized because first first special forces is is a, a paycom aligned to pacific command so asia aligned um so any kind of like if war breaks out in korea like we're the special forces group that goes over there first because that's like our area that's our bread and butter um and so me and Corey worked together uh it was a really hard uh, uh training up a lot of long hours um a lot of really high visibility stuff because once again i was briefing like the first special forces group commander like on a daily basis um so a lot of like high level oversight um but me and Corey got along really well we were doing like combatives training i had brought my boxing gloves and my pads and stuff and we were working out like 
at midnight after finally getting off the job and then sleep a few hours and then back on the job. And, and on the off time, we would kind of chat about the latest in tech. And, and he was a lot more, you know, tech than I was at the time because he kind of knew he's like, you know, green, being Green Bray is great, but I'm getting out. Like, I'm kind of tired of all the traveling, this and all that. And, and so he actually got up for me. Um, he started like a cybersecurity back in tech company. And then I got out at the end of last year. And then, you know, I've got uh, Interco going for me. And uh, yeah, and so we, we decided to partner because I can bring in, you know, the algorithms and all the data analytics and like, you know, that dashboards and all those stuff that, you know, m more of the uh, the guts of the program, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, he builds out uh, the back end. So like the skeleton behind the program like how it fits together where it's hosted and uh what his cybersecurity expertise is you know very very secure um a, a lot of novel techniques there to, to like maximize security uh, uh you know steps ahead of like the two-factor and everything else that's hash tables that everyone's using at google or aws or what have you um so so, so just really cool partnership there uh, David was with me in the combatives club. That's how I met him. Yeah. So me and him went to school together. Um, and we met at the, at the little fight club I had created back in the day. Um, and he ended up, uh, he is working on his PhD in artificial intelligence and computer science over at Georgia. Um, and so he's been doing some crazy cool research. Uh, he's been super busy and heads down. And so I, I don't get that much time with him, but when I do, it's, you know, it's always good. Um, and it's, uh, it's, he's got that like detailed framework where, you know, I've got like my project and the ideas I'm working on and this and that, and then he's able to provide that, you, you know, granular, uh, framework or sometimes like novel solutions or ways to tackle problems that we hadn't really thought about, um, or that we hadn't like looked into or developed, uh, but yeah, they were all, yeah, all friends, uh, all friends at some point or another. And, you know, I like, I like doing business with friends because there's already a baseline level of trust there, right? Especially, you know, all of these guys I've known for, for many years um, since back in like college, so like 2010, 2009. Uh, and there's that base level of trust. Uh, the professor, so I was back at Illinois Tech for a fraternity event. And uh, I've reached out to a few different professors at, at, at Illinois Tech and Dr. Hajek, he's one of the uh, information technology uh, professors down there. Um, and I ended up having like a quick coffee chat with him when I was in town. We ended up talking some more and then uh, we had a full blown uh, like partnership that, that, that we're pushing with. Um, and with the main focus of getting these like SBIR, STTR grants. So a lot of these like federal research grants require um, some sort of partnership with like a school or an education infrastructure. Um, and so it ended up being a very mutual thing there because it's good, you know, it's good for his career. It's good for, for him to show that uh, while they're restructuring different categories in the computer science and the IT management and all the different education systems out there, um, he's, you know, working with us to help develop like the latest in AI. So it's a lot of like name recognition and, and, and you know, good work for him. And then for us, we're able to get like that mentorship and that, you know, experience behind it as well. Um, and then we also, we can plug in some of his interns and students on some of our projects. Uh, one of them actually, uh, one of our first iterations of Word, he ended up winning like a pitch competition down there in the school um, and got like, I don't know, it was like a thousand dollars or something like that. But, uh, but uh, you know, we were very happy that we were able to kind of plug him into one of our projects and he did a little like offshoot student project with it and then ends up, you know, doing great things. So I'm all about, you know, creating value for everyone that I'm partnered with. Like I, I, I want everything to be mutual and I think that's the best way to grow. So don't, don't tell us the details, but how did you all figure out like the title equity? How do y'all walk through all that kind of, you know, founder, initial founder conversations? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we tried keeping it as simple as possible, and uh, and a lot of it is um, how would I put it? A lot of it's kind of based off like sweat equity, if you will. So like, how much time and effort are people putting in? What projects are we moving the needle on, and whatnot? Um, but it's it's uh, our, our our framework has been fairly uh, fairly fluid, um, and you know like vesting schedules, so like time in and, and, and even for myself included, like, you know, trying to be like egalitarian and, and as democratic as possible. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I can't get into too many specifics. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying to be as fair to everyone as possible. 
Um, okay. And then, and, and I would highly suggest using proper vesting schedules for anyone starting up like a startup or a partnership or anything like that. Um, Cause that keeps people honest and it stops, you know, someone from joining the team in the beginning, not putting value in and taking off like a year or two later, which, you know, ha- unfortunately happens. Happens a lot more often than people know. Yeah, so I would, yeah, I'd, I'd be very careful with that. And I'd highly suggest, um, you know, doing all the right things as far like the laws around it are actually very broad and, and you have a lot of wiggle room. So, so try to do the right thing, get the best like legal framework you can, and then use, use proper vesting schedules. And, and for, for CEOs, like you're so for, for everyone included. Um, and then obviously there's different frameworks you could do with, uh like parent companies and all that stuff so there, there there's a lot of freedom there and i think uh the suggestion i would get for somebody starting out would be to kind of do your, once again like do your research see what your end goals are because there's different tax benefits obviously to different legal structures uh, whether it's like you know your double taxation or how you're getting paid out through distributions or through shares or what have you so so i, I would suggest people kind of do their homework and just really figure out what framework would work best where they want to be in five years or next year or what have you and then kind of work off that so bernard your company's involved in ai machine learning VAR, and blockchain can you give like a brief explanation of what yeah. it does what it is yeah yeah no no absolutely and 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 i know it's i know it sounds a little confusing and i'm still working it with like, like star techie star wars yeah you know. yeah and so so the reason it's it sounds confusing and i yeah you know i talk to angel investors all the time and they're saying like what is it you guys are doing like i see all of this i see like blockchain in there but do they, do they tell you you're doing, that you're doing too much yeah well and and so the whole point is um and obviously it's still you, you know it's a work in progress and we're always like filtering down and, and consolidating but uh the reason all those tech stacks are there is uh our, our end goal is to provide a holistic solution like a custom holistic solution based on each client's needs um so right now we're putting product in in several clients hands and they're very different products i mean very very different products so what we're doing is we're providing like a custom solution that takes in any of these technologies and synthesizes it to something that'll move you know your company and advance your company and, and build that progress. Um, so for example, uh, I'll give you like one of the VR examples. I'm actually, uh, I'm volunteering at the Center for Wooden Boats where I'm learning how to sail. Had a, an awesome sailing class yesterday. The wind was on the water. We were going fast, healing over and everything. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so I'm happy to help them out. And so so for them, we're, we're building out a virtual reality uh, instructional for like their intro to sailing classes. Um, Cause a lot of like, and it, it was, you know, not that it's a problem but maybe like a place to improve like when i was taking the course you know i had a hard time remembering like wait which side is like the booms here which side is the leech of the sail where is like the main uh uh halyard like where where is like what what's this line here called and then with this virtual reality instructor uh that we're building for him somebody would be able to take like a tablet or their phone and then while the instructor is there in the video showing like, here's the boom of the main, you know, of, of the main sail, you'll be able to go in there and like, look around, look up, see what the sail looks like, look down, we're adding in like metrics, like an arrow that's pointing to little things and showing like, for example, like this main sail is this much surface area provides this much lift. So that's where like the, our data analytics portion comes in. Um, so our, our whole thing is we're synthesizing everything. So not only are we able to provide like, the measurements of the boat or of the sail, the capabilities, how heavy is like that half a ton keel behind it? Like what are the physics behind that? But now people are able to visualize that and see it, not just in a tablet or in a phone while they're clicking around and looking around, but also in a virtual reality headset if they have it. So I know like I I bought the the Oculus Quest. I'm a huge fan of that. It's the first like untethered, like good virtual system that's out there. Um, so you don't need a, you don't need a cell phone in there. You don't need to plug it into a high end gaming computer. Like it's, a, you know, you could just plop, plop, plop it on. I could use it in the airport. I could use it here if I, if I had brought it. Um, and so, so we're giving people that ability too. So now you can take that course in a virtual reality headset. If you have it, it doesn't have to be the Oculus Quest, but, uh, you put that headset on and now you're right next to the boat and you're looking, I'm looking at the instructor the way I'm looking at you. And when you're, he's pointing out like, here's the the jib, here are the two lines that control the jib, this is how you do it, you know, and then we're moving forward to like, here's how you do a uh, attack, turn, here's the dive, turn, like, here's what, what, uh, what a broad reach on the sails is, here's what a close reach is, and now, instead of somebody just explaining this, 
uh, through Zoom or showing you diagrams and drawings and, and reading it through your book, which is the way it currently is, we're bringing them to that next level and showing them in virtual reality, whether it's on a phone, a tablet, or a headset. But you're able to pause the video, look around, zoom in, and see like, okay, I see how that little line's connected. I see how they tied this knot. You know what I mean? And we're trying to give that, uh, give that immersion factor. Um, and how does this translate, right? We've uh, been in a few talks with different like manufacturing companies, so we can do the same thing, whether it's like, you know, even a mechanic company somewhere out here and, and they want to refresh or train up some of their mechanics on like changing out an engine cylinder or what have you. Well, now we can provide that to them virtually with metrics and with diagrams and they can run it two or three times in the comfort of their own home before coming into work and doing it the next morning. Um, same thing for like manufacturing processes or uh, or any kind of like training scenarios or events so we're building simulations uh, that incorporate real world data um and and so then so that kind of steps us into like the framework right so to build that framework we have to build databases we have to host stuff online we have to like properly secure everything and make sure all the apis and sdks talk to each other uh, and, and and that's where like our system kind of uh, shines too. It's uh, it's fluid. It's customized to your needs, and then we can take care of all the maintenance, all the upkeep. It's a turnkey solution. Um, we want to be able to provide our clients with hey, like what is it that you want to do? This is the technologies that we can integrate and work with, and they're all the latest because we're using what's out there. We're using like the best stuff we can get, hardware wise and software wise. Um, and and then provide that like cutting edge solution for our clients, um, and it's it's fully customizable. Uh, and going back to like, so blockchain, you know, a lot of people might know how it works. A lot of people might not. It's it's a distributed ledger, right? It's like a uh, a registry, an anonymized registry of every transaction on the network. And I don't want to get into a big like rabbit hole with blockchain. Like, there's a lot of YouTube videos that explain it way better than I can. But at the end of the day it's used to like store and transfer data and you can see the history behind like that data. So for example, really easy and, and easy to grasp use cases would be like, um, like a, a house like deed record or like medical records or even like a car record, right? Like right now we've got Carfax, right? Which is like run by, you know, Carfax and it's a little sheet that tells you where it, who's owned this car, what kind of damage has been on it. Right. So, that can be edited, that could be like doctored, you could not report stuff or what have you. With blockchain, um, every every person and like their duration or location or whatever kind of tags you wanna add to it is all stored on a ledger. And it, it's called a chain because it's building blocks on a chain. So like if I hand you this tablet and then you hand it to Matt over there and then Matt hands it to me, when I get it back and I look at the blockchain behind it, it'll show that it went from me to you, to Matt, to me, and nobody can change that. So that's where blockchain comes in. And that's where um, we're, we're using it more so as like a backend, like tracking framework for different client use cases if they need it. Um, if they don't need it, we don't add it in there and we don't you know, integrate it because if it's not needed, it's not needed. But we have that capability. Um, so that, that's, more, uh, that's more like an addition, to a, a capability addition we can add if needed. So Bernard, you personally, what, what are you excited about more? The AI, the machine learning, the VR, what, what excite, are those, what excites you the most? Oh man, yeah. Um, it, hard to choose, you know, I'm a big, AI is the future, machine learning is the future. Uh, it's gonna change the world for sure. Um, and I think it's gonna change it as much as like the internet has changed it. I mean, we've, we've got 5G and IoT coming out and all of this is gonna be connected. All the street signs are gonna be connected. Um, you know, you know, they're all the data gathering that that's there, uh, which is another part of the reason we're building that data analytics platform, because people are going to have data they never had before on everything around them. And uh, just imagine what kind of efficiency you can build, what kind of waste you can get rid of that you didn't even know was there. Um, so what's like an easy example for like IoT in the cities, right? Um, you could have like, every dumpster in the city has like a little measuring device. And now the trash pickup company knows 
is this dump through 70% full? Is it 85% full? And then the AI algorithm will be able to track kind of like a Google Maps for the driver or for the autonomous you know, the, um, truck. The 71. Yeah, yeah, it'll show you, hey, all of these are past 70% or past 65 or whatever. And then it could calculate what's the fastest route to all of those and then just leave the rest for Which like- in theory will save lots of money. Yep, save a lot of money on driver hours, on vehicle maintenance, on like wear and tear. Um, one of the problems I would love to solve with uh, with our product line, Adam, that's the analytics portion uh, 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 of it, um, uh, automated uh, data analytics and measurements, uh, Adam. And uh, for that product line, we're, we're taking in novel data inputs and then helping you analyze it through our use of like our custom algorithms and then displaying that to you in like a really easy to use AI with dashboards, graphs, um, and we'll provide like a full turnkey there as well. So whether you want... Um, to, to keep going with that solution, let's say they want, uh, you know, I want to be able to pick up all the trash that's over 70% full. I want it to be done like as fast as possible and reduce like overhead, whether it's man hours or uh, vehicle maintenance or what have you. So we can bring that data to bear and help out. Um, so one of the big problems that, that could be solved to would be like traffic, for example. Uh, like what if we were able to prove using all this data that we're collecting with IoT and 5G and everything, that I, uh, you know what, like if we change these roads this way and make like a few modifications here, now all of a sudden, like all the traffic we've got on I-5 has kind of gone away. Or what if we're able to show um, if people stagger their commutes this way or, or you know, uh, uh, work changes. Um, I mean, a lot of it's remote now, but, but you know, the hours change or what have you or different roads go different ways. Like we, we, we could help people either cut their, their travel time or help companies like you know reduce that churn reduce all the all the all the white noise and 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 have actionable data that will actually improve their their products their own capabilities so we you talk some of one product like adam next talk about your product line i believe it's called odin odin yeah 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 um uh yeah optical display integration network and uh odin is our vr ar platform so it wasn't after the god of Thund god of thunder's father nothing. yeah no 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 yeah yeah no no it, it is based off the norse myth mythological obviously yeah yeah odin um i'm a big fan of mythology growing up like i would always read like all the greek myths norse myth um like the egyptian mythology uh the aztec stuff i was super into all of that um so yeah so i am nerding out there a little <laughs> bit but yeah so odin is our uh uh, you know the first two words right optical display and that's why uh that that's the vr like headset stuff that i was uh talking about and and we can also build this out in, in augmented reality which is more what like the manufacturing clients are looking for and more what uh what what like you know instructional like mechanics or, or manufacturing or or even um like city planners architects or whatnot so we could go into like a bare bones room and then let's say you know you didn't have any of this equipment out there we could put it for you using 3d models and then you can play around with the layout of this room oh what if i put my desks over here what will that look like and you have like the hololens so our first prototype was built off hololens one um and so i don't know if you've messed with that before but you could see the real world it's a clear lens and then added to it there's 3d objects and models so you could be like standing right here it's an empty room where do i want to put my lighting how's that going to look where do i want my speakers how does that look and that's just you know more of like a, a basic scenario but we can get advanced to the to the point of um and that the other part of it you know uh integrated network because we're integrating to databases that either we're helping our clients build or we're uh cleaning up data the clients already have in their databases and adding that so you're walking down a manufacturing line right um you've got you know, a HoloLens or equivalent AR glass on. And while you're looking at everything, it's showing, you know, how many hours of work have been on this generator. This generator has 500 hours. It's got a lifespan of 850. You're at like, you know, you've got 35% of usable lifetime left before a new maintenance event is going to be needed. And instead of having to go in there and look at like the little numbers on the digits of the generator and how many uh, hours working it's got, you literally just look over it. Um, our system will recognize what 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 object it is so that's the large part of that's the there's ai behind that that's seeing the object for lack of a better term and i won't i won't deep dive into how like artificial intelligence sees because it doesn't really see it translates photo frames from videos okay into like mathematical that. bit bit maps and then it like analyzes that because it's computer it can't see like what i was going back earlier it's dumb it can't just like see and realize like it's got to turn it into math somehow and then 
see that way. Uh, but, but yeah, I won't get into details. Um, but basically, you could go over like a generator or your car or my motorcycle or whatever. And as long as we've created that, that analytics platform behind it for you, it'll read it, it'll see it, and then it'll show you what's going on with it whether it's like tire thread or this or that you get we get updated for you you get we can provide a simple ui for you to you can walk down with a tablet instead of the ar goggles and put the camera over it it'll recognize it it'll show you the 3d image and then it'll give you the metrics so that's that's odin it's um it's how much data and information can we uh, acquire collect and store and analyze for you and then display it in a way that you can use it to understand your surroundings understand your business better and make some data-driven decisions at the end of the day all of our products are built for our clients to be able to make data-driven decisions um we're we're big fans of, of using data for good and uh and if, if if it gets our clients more value and it makes them more profitable well we're right there with them so uh it, once again I, I believe in you know that mutual uh, we help you, you help us, and, and everybody grows together. Um, so that's why we want to provide the best solutions possible. And the last one is Ward, W-A-R-D. Yeah, and, and yeah. Um, world, uh, Word, so World Active Reporting. Um, and, so uh, no, no mythical god? No, 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 no. So, so and this was a funny, so, so the story behind this one, um, you know, going to tech school, there's a lot of nerdy people, a lot of really smart people in it, and, and we were uh, uh, back in the fraternity days. Um, we used to play a lot of video games. Uh, I was either like racing motorcycles and cage fighting or playing video games. Like it was, you know, there was like no in between. It was either super nerdy or super athletic for me. Um, and in one of the games, it was called Dota Defense of the Ancients. And it was like a, a, a MOBA game, a massive online battle arena. Uh, and, and basically there's like a, like a map, right? And it's got, you know, different mountains and rivers or whatever. And you go around and you try to sneak around and attack the enemy and destroy towers. And the, the goal is to like get to their goalpost to like their base and destroy their base. Um, but you can only see the areas of the map that you or your team members are on. Uh, so the rest of the map would be dark. You couldn't see it unless somebody's in there. So the enemy could be hiding in these bushes or over a hill and setting up an ambush. And then when you and your two friends walk by, there's five bad guys and they got you and then it's game over. But there was one item called a word. And the word was the one that would, uh, uh, you could place it down in the bushes. And it was like a little camera of sort, not a camera, but it was like a little magical item, little totem that you could drop there. And it would see a small area of the map for you. So we would drop them into like areas where the enemies might be hiding. And then this way we could travel across the map knowing that they're not there because if they were, we would see them through words. So that's kind of the beginnings of that one. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, world active reporting and detection. And, and so the, the theory behind word is um, it's basically an AI powered uh, security camera, if you will. Um, but it's also the framework that builds like Odin. And, this, and now you'll kind of start to see how it all fits together. So, so Ward is the object detection platform. So we use AI once again to see what things are. We teach it what different things are depending on the client need. Um, and it'll identify this. It could drop like a description of it. It could, uh, it, it's got all kinds of functionalities, right? So we're, uh, we're in talks with a few like special operations units out of Fort Bragg because they're looking at maybe using it for some recon aspect of it. Uh, I mean, we could get it to the point where we're integrating it with their current surveillance cameras that they're using downrange, um, and it'll generate an automatic sit rep or situational report for them. And it'll kind of be like a double check on, on the reconnaissance mission. Uh, and the cool thing about Word is uh, we could train it to see pretty much anything given the right data set. Um, so I had a question from, from one of our clients, right? And he asked, well, how far can it see? And I was like, well, well, it doesn't really see, but, but, but well, what are you trying to get to? And he's like, yeah, well, let's say, you know, I've got the camera over here, but I want to see something that's like 200 meters through this warehouse or on this field or whatever, or in this, you know, lot. And it, like, would it be able to identify something in there? And I told him, okay, well, yeah, well, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not really about how far it sees. It's about what we teach it to see. So we could, you know, for example, we were part of this nonprofit uh, uh, drive, like a little project drive. Uh, and what, what, what we were doing there was we were taking satellite imagery um, and there was a big data set provided through, uh, it's a bunch of nonprofits and uh, I think it was like wildlife service or something. Uh, 
federal, some federal government entities were taking uh, uh, satellite images to see like wildfire, hurricane, volcano damages, right? And so you teach the AI how to see what a normal house looks like from a satellite image and what a destroyed house looks like. And then it's able to see, you know, which houses are uh, normal, which ones were destroyed and then count them and then add in like geotagging locations and stuff like that. Um, so really, I mean, it's not about like how far it sees, it's about what we teach it to, to see. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if that example makes sense, but it's, it, you know, it could go from satellite imagery to like me seeing you right now and I get the tech, oh, this is Jason. Uh, he might be doing a podcast because he's got, you know, a microphone and his laptop and a desk set up. Like if, if that's what we wanted to teach it to be able to do that, we could teach it that um, given the right data sets. And there's, kind of, there, there's different ways to like grow a small data set and properly, uh, you know, shift images around to really teach it well. Um, so it really depends on what the client's looking for. Uh, but, but it's very agnostic. We get, we could teach it pretty much anything, whether it's satellite imagery or whether it's, you know, seeing that generator or that motorcycle or that car and then recognizing what object it is. And then, you know, we display what all the metrics threw out in. So it recognizes the words, the framework, it's the object detection one. As far as the product line goes, um, we pair it to security cameras and most of our clients are like, uh, either, uh, like residential security or like manufacturing security. Um, we're looking at, uh, at putting it in the field and, in, 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 uh, an investigation firm, an international investigation firm. So that's one that I'm, I'm personally very excited, uh, to see how, how we're able to bring some value to them because, um, it's going to go from the point of them having to have you know an investigator out in the field in one location to like now this investigator can drop off three or four cameras in different locations the cameras are going to tell you know with our ai platform they'll be able to detect whether it's somebody coming in and out of like a location whether it's cars driving by whatever they'll be able to, to see it read it and then send that as a sit rep out either to like the investigator and the firm and the manager or whatever and it's all in real time all through our database and all like easily uh produced for them through our simple ui so that's where it's like once again a custom solution and let's say um you know the investigator is trying to to look at multiple entry and exit points or you know these uh reconnaissance uh uh operators from brag are, are trying to see like okay well how many enemy are there or how many buildings are here or what are the routes over there we could teach it to like to help we could teach it to help see okay well there's like four houses here or there's five people moving back and forth here there's set there might be a seven or eight person there um and it's it, it's all a matter of, of how we train it up and how we develop that framework but it's very uh very capable so Bernard, for the ward older adam are you building them all at the same time? Are you like, are you emphasizing a, a, a build out on one of them or more advanced other ones? Or are you building all three at the same, like same yeah. at the same time? Yeah, no, no, good question. And it's something that uh, it, it's been very fluid. Um, so it depends on like what dev manpower we're getting, what the latest client need is. Uh, so right now we're really, uh, we're building out um, the third generation of Word. So our third generation of camera, like object detection. Um, we're trying to get a smaller package we're using uh, uh, some new accelerator hardware that just came out from, from some of the major companies. Um, and we're also looking to like add in some custom manufacturing form factors to like make a smaller uh, hardware product. Cause you know, we could do the cloud thing like a lot of other startups do where we're running the AI on the cloud. Sure. Um, but where we bring in other value for like Word exam for example, is we can plug into your existing camera infrastructure and add in our AI technology on the background uh, uh, through edge compute. So edge compute is when you have actual hardware running, you know, the AI platform. So instead of it living on the cloud, where now when your internet runs out or if somebody hijacks your Wi-Fi or what have you, now you lost that compute. With us, it's still safe, secure through that edge compute. So that's where we bring up another benefit to people that, uh, that other, you know, there's all kinds of data analytics companies and object detection companies that are running on the cloud. Well, we're running it on hardware that we could plug into your existing infrastructure. Um, so for example, one of, uh, uh, one of our first clients was actually uh, uh, my dad. So we built the Word platform and, uh, and set up the security cameras at home. And, uh, you know, cause we didn't have any security cameras and they, they live in a, in a fairly busy neighborhood. Um, and so now, you know, anytime, let's say the mailman goes up and drops something off, 
word like sees the mailman walk up sees him drop a package and sends an email or a text and uh and does like a cloud database and a hardware push of that video clip of those photo frames and of what's going on um and so so that's where it really shines it's like let's say somebody cuts that wi-fi out in the residence or, or the power goes out or whatever if you've got a backup generator or what have you it'll still be running it'll still be running the compute and um you know, we can even put uh, different like RF signals on there to where we can get data through like a mobile SIM or what have you. So all kinds of different uh, really cool applications. And, and we're really excited to see how, how future clients kind of take it. We, we already have a few interesting requests from, uh, you know, customization requests from our clients. Um, and yeah, I think uh, by the end of the year, we're going to have a, a much stronger product and probably our fourth or fifth generation. What's been the hardest part about building the company so far? uh ooh. um it's it's a grind and i know like other entrepreneurs everybody knows it right it's like there's no secret it's 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 work work hard but also work, work smart um and i think the hardest part for me was uh getting rid of that mentality because originally i did kind of want to do it all myself and then yeah, after a few months very quickly realized that it's just not possible and then i need to get help and even if it if it takes you know whether it's like money or equity or partnerships or what have you profit sharing or whatnot, like it, it's worth it to start building out a bigger team and start like being able to, uh, 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 not specialize, but tackle different portions of the problem together. Um, so that's where we're in the process of right now. And I think that that was the hardest part was kind of like letting go of this baby and sharing it with people and starting to grow it that way. But, um, we're, uh, we're moving fast now. We're looking at a lot of internships, uh, with like UW, Illinois tech, um, UT Austin, uh, and and we're looking to get you know some really bright students and 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 offer them some sort of you know some paid and unpaid internships and maybe like uh, uh, the opportunity for for full time employment when they graduate or even you know if, if if they're doing really good and they've they they're really good learners you know I don't care whether somebody has a bachelor's degree in computer science or not like if they can provide value and do some good work. Uh, I'm, and then they bring that value to the company and we're in, and, and the clients, uh, I'm happy to like extend offers if, if, you know, stuff's moving well. Um, but so that's the push we're doing right now. We're, we're really looking to, to bring in some, uh, some new blood and, and some new, uh, some new people onto the team and, and kind of seeing how things go, seeing if there's a good fit, seeing how the techs develop and, uh, and yeah, we're excited to see to see what happens moving forward. So Bernard, talk about the importance of validating your idea, product market fit, and how your company went about doing these. Um, and so this was a hard portion for me too, was getting, being happy enough with the product to get it out in, in people's hands. And, and that's like, well, you know, reading like the lean startup and I'm always reading, I'm on Audible all the time. I crush maybe like three and a half books on average a month. Like uh, I'm, I'm always, always reading. Um, and uh you know, like in the lean start, what they talk about is the feedback loop and iterating, right? Get the product out in people's hands, start iterating, and then start fixing it there. But don't wait until the old days of like MBA classes teaching you to like create this really cool product. Don't tell anyone because your competition is going to steal it. Uh, uh, you know, fix it up, package it, and then start presenting and start selling and start selling. And those it's days like, are long gone. Yeah, those days are long gone. Uh, you're absolutely right. And and now I think that's part of why, you know, one of our core values is innovation because we're, 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 we want to work fast. We want to take the latest and greatest and, uh, and, 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 and we want to build quickly, get our product in people's hands and then iterate. Um, and so for me, that was a little hard to let go of that whole, like, Oh, I'm trying to plan a good product and trying to like really wait until it's something that's really pretty and well packaged. And then we're sending it out. And now we're, we're, yeah, we're sending products out. And then what we're doing is we're providing um, a really strong, like support network where we're fixing issues, we're iterating on whatever's there. If we need to ship out new hardware, we'll ship out new hardware. Um, but, but we're really focusing on, on once again, that like reaction. Uh, and it's funny, uh, which book was it? Is well, one of the books was talking about like evolution and, and Charles Darwin, right? And, um, you know, people say like, well, well, what, what really is like survival of the fittest, right? Is it like the biggest, the strongest, the smartest, right? Like, so, so, so what would you say? Like, well, what are a few things you? Think? I would say someone who can adapt the best. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's exactly what it is. It's it's who reacts the best and the fastest. So you, there there could be a, a smarter, stronger species out there, but if they don't react, you know, well, um, the species that reacts better is is going to take over. Like, look at us and uh, um, 
what is it, Neanderthals, right? Uh, Neanderthals were way bigger than us, way stronger, and by us, I mean Homo sapiens, of course, uh, way bigger than us, way stronger than us. And they, there's actually recent studies saying that they might have been smarter, that they had bigger brains, and they very likely could have been smarter. Um, but why are we the ones that are launching astronauts into space and they're long gone, right? I mean, a few of their genes remain in certain like European populations and stuff like that based on geography. Uh, but overall, I mean, they're, they're gone. They're long gone. Uh, even though they were bigger, they were a lot bigger and stronger and they were, they possibly, uh, much smarter too, but we're the ones around and they're not. And, and that's a testament to like, it's not the biggest and strongest, it's the best reactive and the fastest and the most fluid. Uh, so that, so that's kind of what we're trying to embody. We're trying to embody that that uh, human spirit of like adaptability and uh, and moving fast and reacting and fixing issues and getting that value to our customers. So for your customers, what demographic are you going after? Like what's your target demographic? Yeah, we're not, um, we're, we're not really focusing on any, any like specific target. And, and I am looking to bring on, you know, a marketing expert because I, I, re I fully realize that that's one of the shortfalls that I've got, you know, focusing on building the tech out and building the team out. And it's the marketing is a whole another beast that I, you know, like going back to our conversation, like I don't have time to learn that it's, it's, I know it's very in depth and I'm going to, I'm focusing on, on where I can bring the most value. And we are looking to bring in a, 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 a good uh, marketing aspect to it. Um, but that's part of why all of our solutions, we're trying to be as broad and as general as possible and then provide that custom framework. So it really depends on, on what the client wants and how they can use it. And that's why, you know, you go to our website, uh, yeah, schedule free uh, consultation because I kind of want to talk over your pain points, see see what's going on on the client side, see where we can bring in some of this tech, and then troubleshoot some ideas. Um, but really, I mean, anything uh, anything's possible nowadays. And I know it sounds cheesy, but with like AI and the way tech's going, uh, quantum computing's just over the horizon, IoT's just over the horizon. Like, there's going to be some huge changes in the next five years. That's for sure. As an entrepreneur, how do you how do you do, how do you handle this? Like an entrepreneur, you you know, doing so much stuff, right? And then and then stuff pops up. You're not you know you're not you really know what's going on. Things coming up. You have a calendar. How do you know what to focus on each day? Do you just like go off your calendar? Do you wing it? Like what's your like your, what's your plan of attack? <laughs> yeah, mean? yeah. No, uh, great question. And it's something that I didn't learn. I learned very late. I feel like or I I I got this latest update a little late. It was towards the end of last year, and I was at an event, at a networking event, and I was talking to an angel investor, and and I asked him that same question because I was already starting to get swamped then, and and he replied, "Work off your calendar," is what he told me. Um. And at first, you know, I was telling I was like, oh, well, I've got my to-do list. And I kind of worry, he's like, no, to-do list or shit, work off your calendar. And, and the, the, you know, that's what he said. And, and, you know, I thought about it and I started working off the calendar. You know, I started with putting the to-do list on the calendar and obviously that wasn't really working. And then I realized like, you know, read a few books, like some Harvard business reviews on like time management, work improvement. I'm a big fan of like self-help books. I'm crushing, I read mostly nonfiction. Um, and I realized like what he meant after like reading some of those books that it's like, oh, literally put everything you're doing at the time you're doing it on your calendar and then put a reminder like, I, you know, I like working with like a half hour before and like a day or two before, depending on what the event is. And this way on my phone, uh, I'll see when, when these items pop out of my calendar and I can reschedule or schedule or move stuff around and I'll put everything even like, you know, I was on Rainier a few weekends ago, Mount Baker, and I'll throw that into the calendar and, and I, yeah, I try to incorporate everything off the calendar. And I think, you know, that's, uh, that's what he meant when he said work off your calendar for sure. Cause uh, it's, it's improved my productivity. Um, so instead of a to-do list, it's, it's still a to-do list, but it's all on the calendar. And, and I would highly suggest that to, to anyone starting off or even anyone that, that's already been in for a while that's not really using calendar to your advantage. Um, I mean, Google Calendar, uh, you know, the, the Apple, uh, the iPhone calendars, like everything nowadays, is, it makes it pretty easy for you, but you still got to you gotta mess with it and you got to play with it and you got to always update. So I find like the calendar is probably one of the most opened apps on my phone. Yeah, yeah I, I do think, the same thing. I like my wife got mad at me. So like, Jason, what are you doing like on Sunday afternoon? I don't want to have to look at my calendar. Like, how do you not know what you're doing? I'm like, yeah. no, I have to look at my calendar, right? It's like, there's no way I can know. There's too much going on. No, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's no way. Uh, luckily, in this day and age, we don't need to have a planner. We don't need to have, like, a calendar on the wall. Now it's all, you know, it's all right in here. It's all easy to use. And it now it syncs from my phone to my laptop to this. I can share Calendly's or whatever. Um, yeah, no, I, I would say work off the calendar and, and, uh, and, and there's no other way to do it. Not until we've got that neural link on our brain that's got, you know, 
digitized everything. Like until then, yeah, it's it, you kind of work out the calendar. So Bernard, since the time you became an entrepreneur, talk about something that you learned that wasn't expected. It could be something good you learned, something bad you learned, but something like you totally learned that was not expected when you started. Hmm. Let me see. That's a good one. Um. Yeah, I I I think I've kind of developed some uh, some some kind of tenants I I try to live by uh, as much as possible. And I didn't really learn them until like I really started getting busy and really started pushing ahead and learning and iterating and everything. Um, but I would say like the tenants that I try to live my life uh, off of um, would be uh, uh, be grateful. So be grateful for everything you have, um, uh, and 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 expose yourself to environments that'll that'll build more gratitude as well. Um, so for example, one of my last missions was in Africa with third special forces group last year. And I got to see, you know, how, how these people are living in Western Africa, right off of the Sahara. So like very barren, very like poor, or one of the poorest nations on, on the entire earth. Um, and so we were out there helping them out with some anti-terrorism training and, uh, and there was some really bad stuff going on where, you know, terrorists were coming out of the Sahara and the, or the Sahel and uh and and uh wiping out entire villages like we're really uh sad stuff going on over there so it was really cool that, that we got to go out there and really help you know train up some of their uh security forces and, and their military and everything but being in, immersed in that environment made me realize like wow we are so blessed to be americans um you know some of these kids i used to carry around little like uh chocolate bars that you know that we had in our little cafeteria and, and the cafeteria was like a tent that we had set up and everything but like you know it, 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 um we uh we had uh, some food and and i I'd, I'd take as many snacks as i could and i'd have my cargo pants full because we were all you know civilian clothing special operations so we're out there like doing the whole out in the villages like you, you know part of my job was uh was managing all the contracts, all the supply chain, all the equipment, all like the footprint, the contracting. Um, it, it was a lot, and, and luckily it got me out in the culture. So I had like my interpreters, I had my, you know, my drivers and everything, and and always tried to give back to them as much as I could, whether it was like buying them some food or giving them like little, you know, items or presents or what have you. Um, but seeing the way they live and seeing the way these villages live. Uh, it, going back to the candies, the reason I had my cargo pockets full of candies was because there's like kids and street urchins everywhere. And I, you know, whenever I had the time or if I could, if I was, you know, doing a quick deal with whatever, I'd finish that up. And then I'd go hand out a few candies, a few chocolate bars. Um, and it was crazy. I remember opening up a, a, an Oreo wrapper and giving it to these three kids. And uh, they looked at it and they looked at me and they're like, what is this? I'm like, I don't, it, you know, it's aluminum. Foil. And I started thinking about it from their point of view. It's like, you know, this American guy just walks up to you and he's giving you something and it's this weird wrapper that's made of like aluminum foil and it opens up. Never and seen it before. There's these black discs inside with this white weird glue in the middle and it's like they didn't really know and I was like trying to give it to them and they're like, I don't know what that is. And then I, like, I, I, I don't like, know oh. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I was like, oh yeah, okay. And so I grabbed one and then I showed it to them and then I bit it in half and I was like, hmm, oh yeah. And then I gave it back to them. And they uh and, and so they grabbed it and they took that first bite and then they all three of them looked up to me and they were like whoa because it's that processed sugar right that Americans are so used to but they're getting it for the first time and it was uh not that I'm for processed sugar because I'm not I you know I try to eat pretty clean but calories are calories especially when you know you're you don't have any like these kids did um and it's you know that that just made me super grateful to be American because seeing like it, the amount of things we're blessed with right uh clean air running water that we can drink um you know i rode here on a motorcycle going down a great highway without potholes and without like you know any of these things where like in in africa it was mostly dirt roads villages like a lot of homelessness a lot of like very you know very very low economic status so like everywhere i went i i tried to help like i used to buy fruit from the same old lady at this fruit market and the fruit stand um and she'd have her two daughters there and i would always i would always like you know, they, they, they don't do like tips or whatever, but I would always try to give her a little bit extra or to come with something or, or whatever. Um, uh, just cause you know, I was building that gratitude bank of, and, and now, you know, whenever I'm, I'm annoyed by something, um, or, or something's, if something's not going too well, I think back to like Africa or some other stuff that I've done in the army, Iraq and, and all that, uh, and think like, wow, yeah, no, I'm grateful to be here. I mean, I live here in Seattle now, like right in the city, you know, I like go, ride my motorcycle go paddleboarding on the lake like 
uh, I always have to remember like when times are hard and I'm working long hours and I'm only getting like four hours of sleep a day for like five straight days and I'm feeling like crap and I'm like, you know what, at least uh, I'm in America and life yes. is good. So how many countries have you traveled to? Uh, I'm a big traveler. I, I fell in love with traveling uh, probably with first group. Um, uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to get to 30. My goal was to get 30 under 30. I'm 31 now. So unfortunately, I didn't reach it. I'm like at 27 or something like that. Uh, so I was three short of, of, you know, 30 under 30. So now my new goal is to get 50 under 50. So I want to get 50 countries. So what's a country you want to go back to that someone might not, might not expect? Like, like um, off the wall country that you want to go back to let's see i'm a big fan of uh i'm a big fan of southeast asia uh like thailand i you know yeah, I, thailand's I did, a great country yeah i trained i trained uh, muay thai in thailand went back in my fighting days and, and that was a huge a very you know awesome experience um i like cambodia too uh egypt was great you know the pyramids the nile river abu Simbel, karnak all these cool temples i, I i'd love to go back to egypt i'd love to go back to cambodia um, but there's so much, like, I haven't been to South America yet. I need to go explore like Patagonia and Chile and Brazil. I want to go to the Amazon rainforest. I want to go to Machu Picchu. Um, so I think, I, I, I don't know if I would do a repeat yet. I think my next focus, I, I was going to be in South America this year and then, you know, COVID happened and, and obviously, uh, every, everyone's schedule got, got switched. Um, but you know what, it, it's almost like it was meant to be cause that allowed me to focus more on business and just push through, uh, but yeah, I would say uh, I don't know if I would do a repeat. If I did, it might be it might be Egypt or Thailand. Yeah. So, what advice do you have for a brand new entrepreneur, someone just starting on the process? Is this a great idea? You know, full of great ideas. You know, he's gonna, you know, conquer the world in six months. You know, all the kind of you yeah. know, you know, stereotypical entrepreneur stuff. For all yeah, through. yeah. Um, and this, you know, a lot of what I've learned it goes back to either like mentors I've met or or uh, books I've read and everything. And I would say. Uh, if if you don't quit, you're gonna win at some point. Yeah, I'm a um, big thing like you know. To my thing, you only feel as entrepreneur if you quit. Exactly, exactly. Um, if you don't quit, you're gonna you're gonna win eventually. And and obviously, there's a lot more factors to that. Like by not quitting, you know, we're also implicitly stating like actually do work, like work hard and work smarter, um, and and learn. I, I I would say learning. If I had to like put it into one word, it'd be learn. Uh, if you you could work really hard and not quit and, and work fairly smart. Yeah. I but think you gotta you be humble, gotta be running to learn, listen yeah. to people's advice. Yeah. And of course, sometimes be willing not to listen to people's advice too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Filter out. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of noise, filter out the bad stuff, try to get the good stuff. And if something that was bad, but you thought was good initially and you tried it out, as long as you learned like, Oh, that was bad. I'm not going to do that again. Um, so for example, I invested a lot in, in Bitcoin and, you know, Ethereum back in that craze. And I had heard about it in college way back in like 2009, 2008. Um, and I, I saw the, the capabilities of it and I loved it from like the tech aspect from like the possibilities that were applicable with blockchain. But I, I didn't know it was going to get monetized by wall street and turned into a commodity and then pumped and dumped. Uh, so I was really investing hard on, on, on that as a technology. I, I figured we would all be using blockchain by now, by 2020. And obviously that hasn't happened. You know, now I've read more about like technology adoption and I'm a big fan of psychology and how like people like early adopters compared to like mainstream adopters and how all that timeline works at the time. I didn't know that, you know, now I do, but you know, I invested, I, uh, you know, I, I made a good amount and then lost. Uh, more than that good amount and so that was a painful lesson but uh but i learned from it now i learned you know that that forced me it was forcing function for me to learn about like technology adoption and like the difference with early adoption and mainstream and and how those like how that fits into not just commodities but products too so that's something that you know is a painful lesson for me a very expensive one but not the first expensive painful lesson i've had and definitely not the last um so i would say yeah learn learn as much as you can and, 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 and don't stop learning. Uh, like I was saying, pick up a book on neuroplasticity um, or, or, you know, psychology and read through that and, and find out what your mind's capable of because it's capable of so much more than you no, I mean, when I look at my, my, my account statements and see money I spend on, like, what was I thinking? Why did I spend money on this for? for what, right? Of course, the time was like, oh, I needed this right now. Now looking back, what was I doing? Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm, uh, I'm in the middle of a little, like, and pass there too, where uh, I'm looking to upgrade some of our some of our computer systems. Um, but then we've got we've got like 
a next generation of video cards coming out in like three to four weeks. So I'm like, Ooh, do I spend this much money on these computers now? This is a pretty good deal. It'll do what I want, but this, this, this GPU company is about to, to release like their latest and greatest in a, in a few weeks. And they just discontinued their last line that, that, you know, compute has in the hardware now. So I'm like, Oh, I don't know, maybe I should wait. And that comes from learning like, what a previous similar mistake to that. Where that's I, a good point. Like, do you spend like more money now on the super stupid, super duper stuff that's going to save money in the long run? Or do you spend like less money now, but by spending less money now, it's going to cause you to spend more money in the long run, right? So like, how yeah. you, it's always hard to balance those two, right? You yeah. never know how it's going to play out. Yeah. 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 You're absolutely right. Um, and it's, it's something that, that once again, you know, I was only able to figure out through learning and a lot of that was through growing pains and spending money and, and, uh, and you know, not always realizing gains, but overall, um, when I first started out, you know, I told people like, well, yeah, we're not, uh, uh, we're not, we're not profitable. Um, I'm actually, you know, in the red from my own personal funds for this amount is what I was telling people, you know, like last year and telling them like, but even though I was in the red by that amount, like the amount of knowledge I gained mm -hmm. with being down, like, uh, that much money was worth so much more than that. And then now that's finally proving to be true. Now we're finally like iterating on all those first generations of products. Now we're like taking in that customer feedback. We're like, you know, jointly developing and partnering where we need to and, and really trying to grow that. And, and, you know, I wouldn't have known that. And, and if it, it, I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't like experienced it and gone through it. Um, so yeah. you say you're going to, you're going to hire a marketer eventually, right? Yeah. So let's say there's a marketer listening right now. He's like, man, this is a great company. I want to work for this company. What would, the market, what, what, what do you expect my marketer to do? For the, how would a marketer impress you to, for you to bring this marketer? Yeah, on? yeah. What do you um, for? And so, so yeah, well, well, one of the big traits that, that, that me and the team are filtering out for is, once again, learning. It's like, yeah, we, we want somebody that's got, you know, experience with, like, search engine optimization, with, like, content production, like, blog, social media handle, like, uh, you know. We, we marketing is, like, expensive, right? People don't realize how expensive marketing is. There's so many different parts of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just doing content marketing by itself is a full time job. Yeah. It's just a small part of marketing as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and we're looking to build a team around, around this person uh, eventually down the line. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we would be looking at like SEO stuff. We'd be looking at social media production, like blog posting, getting content out there, getting tied into uh, uh, different like forums and different already built like marketplaces and everything, and then just starting to to shoot content out. So um, yeah, the big the big factor we're looking for is learning. Like you don't have to know about tech, uh, but you've got a talent for for marketing. You got a talent with figuring things out. Um, our, our interview process is, it, it, it might be a little extensive compared to other, like, you know, uh, uh, positions, but it's cause we're really, we're looking for the right fit. Um, and, and, and obviously once that right fits identified and, and we, we run through the progress, like then there's opportunities for like, uh, compensation as we grow as a company. Um, but initially we're looking for somebody that, that, that is willing to learn. So you don't have to know about the tech. Uh, you know, I've got a little training program, like an intro as part of like our onboarding for new employees that, that that I'm constantly building up with partners and uh and 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 we're using kind of help train people up but we do expect you to be able to figure things out we do expect you to be able to learn so you maybe you don't know about like uh, uh certain um you know platforms or something but you you're going to be expected to like learn about them and then start working it doesn't have to be perfect the first time around where like I said you know uh, innovation. So we're, we're, we're willing to like to, to fail as long as we learn from it. And then we bring value eventually. Yeah. I like believe you, I, I would, I would think you don't want somebody who knows how to launch a product on product hunt, right? Like somebody, at least I know at least to be able to learn how to launch something on product. Hunt. I could definitely see you being on product hunt once you're yeah. ready. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's so much that, like you said, there's so much that comes with marketing. Um, but I guess what I, what I'm getting at is we're, we're open to, to, well, we're going to be doing a lot of interviews and we're open to that. Um, and we don't need, uh, or we don't expect perfection because how can you? And, uh, you know, everybody doctors up the resumes. Everybody makes everything, like, look way better than it is. Um, and, and, and you know, totally got that. And that's why, like, we're really trying to filter out based on, like, how well can you learn and how, like, dedicated and motivated are you? Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's left and right limits. Like, we're willing to work with you to a certain extent. But uh, if we find a candidate that's got that fit, that has, like, experience putting product to market and everything, well, then, you know, we're, we're going to take that into account, but that doesn't mean that 
we're not also looking at some more entry level positions that'll fall under that experienced marketer. So that's why I'm saying we're pretty open right now. We're looking to build to build categories and build teams under those categories. So that's why we're taking a pretty in-depth approach. Uh, we're looking at multiple schools, like all, all good schools or schools that we have some sort of connection with. Like I got the professor in Chicago and he'll kind of be managing like the interns in, in the Midwest region. Um, I'm over here in Seattle. Uh, uh, you know, we got the East coast and, and, um, some some partnerships in uh in austin texas as well which is obviously a huge growing tech scene there um i don't know if you've been down there recently but they're expanding yeah so bernard i understand you have something for our listeners today um yeah we're uh so we're we're, we're launching our uh our latest iteration on our website so that's uh it, it's going live uh, uh today actually um we finished all the web development on that and uh and yeah in there uh, we've got, you know, contact us, uh, uh, schedule consultation and, um, yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what kind of pain points you guys have going on and we'd see what kind of issues are coming in your business and, uh, and see how we can help, you know, bring the latest technology to, to develop products that are custom to your needs. Um, and see how we can help you, uh, uh grow, develop, and use the latest tech to really, you know, get you a, a step ahead of that competition. Cause you, you know, the technology curve is here. You, you like, let's think about the internet, write an email. Um, look at AOL online, right? Uh, uh, this is my pet I can't believe people sell AOL email. Yeah. I just, that drives I me, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, nobody really uses that. Right. Uh, but back in the day they were like the big dog and the number one on the field. Um, but, but, but they were just a subset of like email as a whole. Right. Um, people were still using fax machines. They were still using snail mail. Like people didn't really adopt email right away. And then they did. And then it just took off and now everyone's got multiple emails. Right. Um, so AI and data analytics is, is very, very similar. Um, the frameworks being built right now, uh, with IOT and 5g coming out, is going to expand that framework, you know, by multiples, um, and uh, while there, all these companies, whether you're a mom and pop shop or a big manufacturing firm or whatever, uh, the adoption for artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, data input, it, it's coming. Because if you don't, if you once again, if you don't react, you don't pivot properly, you don't upgrade, your business is going to get shut down. I mean, you're just how are you going to compete with somebody that's got algorithms working 24 seven to improve their products? You it's know, kind of I mean? hard. Yeah, it'll be very, very hard. And uh, by the time you realize like, oh, why did we spend $10,000 on fax machines and like, you know, people to run faxes when we could have just gotten a bunch of email servers and, and done it that way. Um, by the time you realize that and you've spent capital on that as a business, well, then uh, you're, you're going to be a step behind in the competition that maybe saw what was coming. But yeah, you know what? That sounds like the future. Yeah, augmented reality, that's going to be, it's going to be big, especially with IoT and, 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 data integration and displaying and it's it's just a smarter way to get information to and from uh places because i mean we're as humans uh what is it uh, a very large percentage of our brain is like devoted to uh vision right um and so that's one of the biggest ways we could get data in but obviously we were, were like feeling stuff we're listening and, and and we've got uh you know spatial awareness and everything but a lot of that is built off vision and, and a large part of your brain is like is we take in data through our eyesight. I mean, look at like, that's why movies are huge, right? Everybody loves like the Marvel movies and all that stuff. Cause there's all kinds of cool data that you're like brain suggesting. Um, and so, so that's why we're big fans of like Odin and, and building a, uh, uh, AR and VR, because that's a good way to get data across. And if, if you get, uh, like, let's say give your clients, like throw on this headset, this is what this could look like. This is what that looks like. Or, okay, you don't have a headset. Here's a link to our secure web app. Here's your login credentials. They log in on their phone or tablet, and then now they're using the AR and they're able to see the product, whether it's like an architecture firm designing like buildings or a construction firm doing a gut and renovation. And now they could see kind of like, okay, um, the designer is looking at putting, you know, this wall here or this table over here. And then you, you could even add in the plumbing framework and all that. And so we've got Odin, uh, uh, there's a YouTube video on our website that'll show our, our, and this was our previous generation, um, almost a year old now, but, uh, we, we actually did just that. We had, uh, 
different piping and like plumbing on there and different metrics. So here's the water heater, here's what kind of water heater it is. And this was a very basic iteration and kind of like our proof of concept. And, and where we're at now is, is a pretty good step ahead of that. Um, so yeah, so we're trying to help businesses catch up to the future uh, ahead of their competition because it's, you know, it's going to happen where every business, just, just like every business ended up adopting email and getting email and using the internet and getting rid of fax machines and all that. At some point in the in the near future, everyone's going to move to having AI algorithms, to having data analytics, and and that's going to be the new norm because otherwise, your business won't be able to catch up. And so we want to make sure you're ahead of that curve and ahead of your competition. Bernard, can you share your social media for yourself, your company, so people can reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, everything's off of our 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 website, so www.intercoindustries.com. Um, you can see everything on there. We've got our YouTube media uh, link, our social media off of that. And uh, so like I said, I mean, if you've got a business, you want to see how you can adopt the latest and greatest technology, you want to get ahead of your competition, um, go ahead and hit that newsletter button or hit that consultation button and uh, we'll see how we can help you out. And for listeners, we have the links to his gift and his social media on our show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cavinshoblogger.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends. So um, we're coming to the end of our talk. You covered a lot of, and you gave a lot of great value. Any last minute advice and wisdom, anything you want to talk about? Um, I, I would just say uh, uh, read some books. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, of, of the nonfiction, man. I, um, I, I used to be, I used to do the whole like YouTube video and like reading articles and, and all the online stuff. And I still do a little bit, but I try to focus more on, on, on published work and, and, you know, trying to get that that knowledge transferred and then see how I can fit it into a business or my overall life or, or what have you. So I'm, I'm a fan of what I preach and, uh, and I, I try to, to deliver it in every aspect. You know? Hey, Bernard, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate the invite and, uh, you know, it's always fun to come over here and, and hang out here in the, uh, in the lab, if you will. Yes. <laughs> and to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.